This is the Fun and Sexy Finance Show, where we talk about all things money, so that you can learn how to make your money work hard for you, instead of you working hard for your money. I was five years old sitting on the floor of my parents' bedroom, crying, explaining to my father through the closed bathroom door that Eric Schletzky, the big bully who lived across the street, pushed me and I fell down and got hurt. My father's voice coming through the bathroom door. Get up, go back over there and push him back. I can't do that. Why not? Because he's bigger than me and stronger than me. Doesn't matter. If somebody pushes you, you have to push them back. And if somebody hits you, you have to hit them back. And if somebody hurts your brother or sister, you have to fight for them too. Well, okay. So I got up and I went back across the street. Saw Eric Shaletsky. I went over there. I pushed him and I ran home. And that was a defining moment for me. That started a lifetime of pushing back and standing up for others. Fast forward to October 1998. I was leaving my husband, buying a house for myself and my two little girls, and also changing jobs all in the same month. My phone rings. It's my realtor. Did you change jobs? Well, yeah, but it's okay because I got another one. No, it's not okay. You can't change jobs in the middle of escrow. How was I supposed to know that? Nobody told me that was the rule. Not only that, but I had borrowed the money from the 401k at the job I was leaving to make the down payment on the house I was buying. Nobody told me that I was going to have to pay that loan back within 60 days of leaving that job. Another rule that I did not know about. Fortunately, the new job offered to give me an advance on my salary of enough money to pay off that loan. Unfortunately, the new job was a TV series, and so the repayments were spread over a very short period of time, and that meant that my paychecks ended up not being enough money to cover my expenses. It was like I was falling into financial quicksand. Every decision I made, it seemed like it was the wrong one. I didn't know what I didn't know about how money worked. I was getting pummeled by my financial situation. And before I could recover, I would get knocked down again. There was no opportunity to push back. So what could I do? Well, if you can't beat them, join them. So I started to read lots of books and take classes and workshops and seminars and webinars all about money and finance. I was determined that once I figured all this stuff out, I was going to help other women like me who didn't know what they didn't know. I'm an immersion learner. So naturally, I eventually went and got a job in the financial industry. It was like being a spy in the enemy camp. I was learning the secret passwords and handshakes. And OMG, the secrets that I found out. Stuff only the very wealthiest people know about because nobody's going to bother talking to you unless you have at least half a million dollars for them to play with. Because it is a game. It's the wealth game. And the guys in the financial industry think that it's the one with the most money that wins. But that's not necessarily true. You win the game by becoming financially independent. Well, how do we get there? Imagine your happily ever after life. What does it look like? Are you in the same home or are you in a different one? Are you driving the same car or a different one? How much will it cost to get you from where you are to where you want to be? That cost That's the accumulation number. And that accumulation number is going to be different for everybody. 
because some people are going to be dreaming of a villa in Tuscany and driving a Ferrari and other people just want to pay off their mortgage and pay off their car loan and they are happy just right where they are. Trigger alert, financial term coming up. Your accumulation goal will be tied to your net worth. Your net worth is the total of the resale value of everything you own minus all of your debt, everything you owe, your credit cards, your um, mortgage, your car loan, school loans, etc. So that's your net, net worth. And that number is going to grow as you pay off your debt, as you pay off your loans, and as you're building up your savings and your investments. So getting back to your happily ever after life, what is it going to cost to maintain this life? What are your daily, your monthly expenses going to be? So are they going to be more or are they going to be less? About the same. That's the amount of passive income that you're going to need to create. So the passive income number, just like the accumulation number, is going to be different for everybody. If your happily ever after life consists of touring the world in your own private jet, your expenses are going to be higher than the couple who wants to see America in a motorhome. So it's a combination of passive income and net worth that is the goal. And when you hit these two targets, you will have won the game. Wow! And you can do this. It's not, don't think of it in terms of can I. Think of it in terms of how can I. The way to do it is by learning the rules, having a playbook, getting a, a, a strategy for winning the game. And we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Now, we're going to start talking about the rules. We're going to talk about the rules that you need to follow in order to win that wealth game. So rule number one, this is the most important rule. It's the step that will make the biggest difference in your game. And that is you must track your income and your expenses. Now, tracking your income is lots of fun and makes you feel good. So that's the easy part. Tracking the expenses, however, adds a little bit tougher for some people. But it's so important. A lot of people do unconscious spending. When I used to do financial planning, I would sit down with my clients and I would say, okay, let's, um, let's write down everything, that, all your expenses for the month. So they would tell me what they spent their money on and I would put it all into a spreadsheet and then I would put in their income and subtract out the expenses and I'd be like, oh great, okay, so we have $400 left over every month that we can do something with. And they would look at me, their eyes would go wide, their jaws would drop open and they would go, $400, we never have anything left. And they had no idea where that money went. And that's really common. What I find is that a lot of people have no idea how much money they're actually spending on things that had they thought about it, they might rather put that money towards a down payment on a house or something that's more important to their future, to their future happily ever after life. So tracking your expenses, and I don't mean just the big expenses, I mean every expense, at least for the first month, because it's it can be really an eye-opener. So track 
everything you pay for with cash, track everything you pay for with a credit card, a debit card, a check. What are those? Some people know about checks. Those of us who are a little older, um, just track everything, everything you, you spend. Don't forget the Venmo spending and the PayPal. One of the interesting things that happen is when you are tracking your money, you have a tendency to think twice before some of those expenses that you didn't even think once about before. We want to record them all in one place because you're probably thinking, well, why would I track all my Venmo to keep track of all that stuff? And your checking account keeps track of those. Your credit cards keep track of all that stuff is kept track of, but we need to bring it all into one place so that we can look at the data all together. And it's easier if you do it day by day. If you don't, if you miss some, then at the end of the month, you can check over all the different statements from the different places that you spend money and bring it all together. But we want to bring it all into one format. And for that, you're going to want a tracking sheet. This is what a tracking sheet looks like. I use Excel documents, and or Google Documents. So they're really easy to find in Google Docs. And I'm gonna put the, um, the link to see a sample one of mine. You can download um, what, one of the tracking sheets that I use and just follow this link right here. You can also just write it down on a big piece of paper and write it down or use the notes section in your phone. Um, whatever seems more natural to you and comfortable you got to keep it all in one place. I know that like there's a lot of apps that you can use to track your expenses. The problem I find with most of those apps is that it, it only tracks the uh, expenses that are linked to accounts that you link to your app. So if there's stuff that aren't linked to your app, like your Venmo or your PayPal or your cash spending, that stuff does not get accounted for. And you have to manually add that in. And that's easier for some people than others. That's the number one rule. Track your expenses. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the second rule. Rule number two. And this is Oliver here. He was feeling a need to be held. So we are accommodating. Set up your accounts and automate them. So now I'm talking about putting money aside right off the top for certain kinds of expenses. The first fund that you want to set up is going to be to cover the unexpected things that come up. Like your car breaks down, you need it to get fixed. You don't want to be using your credit card for that because later on our focus is going to be in paying off the credit card debt. So we don't want to use the credit cards we don't want to build up more debt when something goes awry. So we're going to set up a fund. Some people would call it emergency fund. You're not going to call it that because what you speak into the universe gets manifested. So we're going to call it a peace of mind fund. Now make sure you set up your peace of mind fund in a savings account that does not have a minimum and does not have a monthly fee. So you're probably going to be looking at credit unions and you want to ask because not all credit unions have uh, free accounts. Some of them do charge and some of them do have minimums. So ask first and then go to use one that doesn't have any fees. The next thing that you want to set up is going to be your play account. Whee! This is important. It's important that you have money set aside for you to have a good time. Because if, it, if you don't, and it, then it's all doom and gloom, um, you're not going to stick to your game plan. So 10% of your income, every time you get paid, goes into the play account. Make it an automatic transfer. Put it in an account where you're not being charged fees. Preferably one that you get a debit card for. So more likely a checking account than a savings account, although a lot of savings accounts have them as well. But one of the things with savings accounts is that you can only do six transfers a month. That's fine if you're putting money in there for the longer term, but with the play account, the money's going to be going in and out more frequently. So put it in a checking account. 
You don't need the checks. You just need the debit card. Put a little sticker on it that says fun so that you remember that's your play account. And then when you're going to go out, you can look at your account. You see how much money is there. That's how much fun you can have. If there's no money in there, pop some popcorn and watch a movie. The next fund that I want you to set up, the next account, is going to be your long-term savings account. So this one goes into an actual savings account. Um, again, one with no fees and no minimums. And uh, the long-term savings account, you're going to put 10% in this one also. Make it an automatic transfer right off the top. And this one is eventually going to be for your investments. This is going to be the one that contributes to your net worth. So it's really an important account to have. Make sure you put the money in there. On future shows, we'll talk about what to do with that money. But just get it set up right away. Okay? So those are the three accounts that you want to have set up, the three most important ones. There's a couple of others, but we'll talk about it in future shows. I don't want to overwhelm you. Just start with those three, and then you'll be good to go. It's a good start. Okay? So that was rule number two. Set up your accounts. Automate them. And let me also just add that one of the reasons for automating is because it takes the emotion out of it. There's a lot of emotion around money. And so when we're making decisions about where to put the money, which bills have to be paid, if we just, we're going to um, every month decide how much money to put in savings, it wouldn't, hardly any money would end up going in there for the most part. But the other thing is it's going to create this whole, um, emotional trauma thing that goes on and causes stress in your brain because you're thinking, how much money should I put in this time? Will I have enough money by the end of the month? Maybe I should wait till the end of the month. And then at the end of the month, there's no money left to put into the savings, right? So to cut out the trauma, to cut out the thinking of it, saves time, saves stress, just automate it. And as much as possible, automate your bill paying. Put your credit cards on automatic payments, so that at least you know that it's getting paid on time. If you want to pay more money towards one of your accounts, you can always go in and pay some more. But make sure that the minimums get paid and that they get paid on time so that you don't have any late fees. Or Because, you know, if you're one day late, you're going to get a late fee. Now, fortunately, it doesn't go on to your uh, credit report until you're 30 days late. But just automate it so that you're protected that way. Okay? So that's it for rule number two. And we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Now it's time for the third money rule. Third money rule is lower your debt. This is really important on several different levels. One, of course, is that while you have debt, you are most likely paying interest. And that's like kind of like throwing money away. I mean, you're paying, it's like you're paying rent on the money that you used that you didn't have, but it can get expensive especially with credit cards, because with credit cards, you're paying compound interest. What's compound interest? This is an important concept for you to understand. There's compound interest and there's simple interest. The two are very different. They work very differently. So simple interest is when you are paying interest based on the original amount. So for example, if you had a dollar and for demonstration's sake, let's just say that you're getting 100% interest every day. So, the first day you have a dollar, 
and then you're getting a hundred percent of the one dollar. So you're getting another dollar. Now you have two dollars. Next day, you have two dollars. And now you're getting a hundred percent of your original one dollar, so you're getting another dollar. Now you have three dollars. The next day, you have three dollars. You're getting a hundred percent of your original one dollar, so you get another dollar and you have four dollars. And so on and so forth till you get to the end of the month and you're going to end up having what? About thirty dollars, right? Well, with compound interest, compound interest is paid on the total amount. So it, the total amount goes up every day, right? So the first day you have a dollar and now you're getting a hundred percent compound interest of that one dollar. So you're getting another dollar. The next day you've got two dollars. Now you're getting a hundred percent of that two dollars. So now you've got two more dollars and now you have four dollars. Next day, you've got your four dollars. You're getting a hundred percent, another four dollars. Now you have eight dollars. The next day, you're going to have sixteen dollars, right? And so on and so forth. Now, how much money are you going to have at the end of the month? Now you're going to have five hundred million dollars. Whoa. And if it took you about 30 days to get to 500 million. How long is it going to take you to get to a billion? Any guesses? I'll tell you. One more day. Whoa, double whoa. Isn't that amazing? The difference between simple interest and compound interest, it's huge. So depending on which side of the compound interest your equa equation you're on, whether you're receiving it or paying it, can make or break you. So if you're paying credit card debt, you are paying compound interest. If you have investments, then hopefully you are receiving compound interest. And it's important to check and to know whether you're dealing with compound or simple interest. And now you know the difference, so you know how to check that, right? Great. To summarize, you win the wealth game by building up your assets and creating passive income. Learn the money rules and develop your strategy. Track your expenses. Automate your cash flow and pay down your debt. Even if you only do the first two things that we talked about today, tracking your expenses and set up and automating your accounts, I guarantee you that a year from now, you're going to see an improvement in your money numbers and you'll be well on your way to winning the wealth game. It will take focus and determination and there will be stumbles and falls. You will get knocked down, but the important thing is that you get back up and you keep pushing through. When you get hit, don't sit on the floor and cry about it. Get up and push back. And that's it for today's show. See you next time.